Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Redeemer Bible Church's online church service. It's January 16th, 2022. I am Pastor Carl Santos, Senior Pastor here at Redeemer. So great to have you. If you're a regular and you're part of Redeemer's family already, then welcome back. If you are just visiting or you're checking us out, well, welcome as well. We're happy to have you worshiping with us this morning. We're going to start the morning off with reading some scripture. So join with me. It'll be on the screen. I know it can feel a little awkward to recite out loud scripture in your home. It's something you probably don't do very often, but let's do that. Let's do it anyway. Let's get comfortable marinating and reciting the word of God together. So let's join me. It'll be on the screen. Psalm 96 verses 1 to 4. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And with that, let's join the worship team now that will lead us in a song. Thank you to the team. And after hearing worship, now we have an opportunity to respond, not just with our voices, but with our tithes and offerings. One of the questions I get asked often is, how come there is no prescription in the New Testament to tithe? And that's very true. There isn't. In fact, many scholars would even say that tithing is an Old Testament thing that has gone out with the old law and the old covenant. But one thing we do know for certain even if the New Testament doesn't say we are to give a certain percentage of our income, gross or net, to the church, what it does tell us is two very important things. One, we should be radically generous compared to the world. Radically generous in how we give and support the people who are in need and those ministries that help serve people in need. And the other thing is, we are told to support the work of the church body that we're a part of, that they gave freely to the need and to the ministry of the church. 
So if you call Redeemer home, then it is your obligation to support Redeemer because you're benefiting even right now from the ministry of the church. And that ministry of our church is aimed at doing exactly what we think Christ is doing in his earthly ministry and now through the church, which is restoring the fallen world, trying to hold back and even reverse the effects of sin in our community and in the world. And for that reason, the programs and the ministry of Redeemer take the form of various things like corporate worship or evangelism or mercy ministries or benevolence and all sorts of counseling. And all of these things are aimed at attacking the sin in the world by lifting up Christ and helping us to understand how to reverse the effects of sin in the world. And so if you're part of Redeemer or you want to be part of Redeemer, it is our obligation to support the work of Redeemer. And that's what tithing is. We obey Christ, we obey God by doing just that, by being generous and supporting his work in the world. So let's take time now. We'll put the information on the screen. Most of you will know how to give. If you're just checking us out, please feel no obligation to give. Giving is part of what you do when you're part of a family and you support the work. Um, so take a look at what's on the screen. Pause the screen now if you have to, but let's give and give generously. We're carrying on our series in the book of Samuel, second book specifically at the moment, and we're looking at Absalom's revolt. So let's read this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a, had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived in Geshur, in Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city Gilo. And, sorry, and the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. So what we're seeing here is a revolution. And it's a revolution in Israel, but it shares a lot of characteristics with revolutions that have happened around the world before and since. Now, revolution is a, f a fundamental and sudden change in the political power and organization of a nation, usually caused by the masses rising up to topple the government or the powers that be. In very simple terms, a revolution is what happens when those on the bottom decide that they won't live the way they have been living in the old system. And those on the top realize that they can no longer live the way they had been living in the old system. And as a result, we see a shift, and usually a monumental shift. That's why revolution, the word itself, is applied to things like the Russian Revolution, even non-violent things like the Industrial Revolution or the Sexual Revolution of the 60s. And it's a radical, topsy-turvy thing. But when we're talking about what's happening in Israel, it is a revolution as far as a political one. And what is the seedbed? What, is it, what are the conditions in a country that, that have to be in place for a revolution to occur? Well, scholars will have a lot of different ideas, but in a nutshell, there's a few things that we can generally say are characteristics of almost all revolutions. Here's what they are. The first one is mass frustration. 
That means the masses of a country, the people, the regular people in a country or in a nation are frustrated with the status quo. Something has happened that has made them lose confidence in the way things are being done and those who are leading. So that's the first thing, mass frustration. The second thing is dissident elites. So it's not enough that the people are frustrated. For a revolution to, to take shape and, and hopefully, well, hopefully, ideally succeed, depending on what side you're on of the revolution, then the elites in the country have to, have to also buy in. So what happens in revolutionary states when things happen like this, it's the elites are also frustrated. Frustrated to the point of saying, I'm willing to risk what I have right now in this current state, in this current status quo, for the sake of something different. So now we have the masses and the elites rising up with disaffection. But that's not enough. What you then need is unity. You need the masses and the elites to somehow come to some sort of unifying motive they have to agree on what the problems are and the best way to solve them. And then once that has happened and a leader has risen up to lead this group of people, then what happens is there's some sort of a crisis. Something leads, it's, the, it's, the, it's like lighting the fuse. Something causes the powder keg to explode. Now that could be an election, it could be a war, it could be a natural disaster, it could be a recession or a depression. Any number of things could happen. But one thing we do know, there is a crisis. There is a moment at which the people on the bottom have had enough. And they move from just talking about dissent to being dissenters and actually having a revolution. So that's what, what we see in most revolutions. Now, in Israel, you are seeing the chronicle of a revolution. From chapter 13 in 2 Samuel through to 19, you're seeing a revolution. How it takes shape and what happens when it starts and how it resolves. Now, we see that there are elites and there is the population in Israel that both agree there's a problem and they rise up against David. They come together against David. And then the moment of the crisis is Absalom's decision to have this sacrificing party in Hebron and to announce that he is king all across the land. And then, of course, it leads to a sort of a civil war, which Absalom ends up losing and losing his life in. But as we look at the question of revolution and this specific revolution in 2 Samuel 15 and how it starts, we have to ask this question. If we look at the problem that caused it, the partners that are involved, and the priorities of the revolters, of the rebels, then we get to learn something about ourselves. Because today, we get grievances as well. We have reason to be dis disaffected, to be upset with the status quo, and increasingly so many people. And as Christians, what do we do with those grievances and those problems? Who do we then partner with? How do we then take those grievances and then respond to them in a way that is healthy? Is revolution the answer? And why is Absalom a failure in this cause? Is it something we can learn for how Absalom fails and why he fails? Well, I think so. And I think if we look carefully at this, we're going to see something about ourselves. We're going to see how you and I deal with grievances and how we are far more like Absalom and Israel than we dare dream. But fortunately, there is a way out as well. So let's look at those three things I just mentioned. We're going to look at the problems that are happening in Israel, the partners, the people that they partnered with, these grieving groups, and then the priorities that they shared and, what the, and how that impacted the outcome. So the problem, the partners, and the priorities. Let's jump right in. So the problem. If you're of a certain vintage or if you like classic rock, you may remember a band, well, maybe not, they're not very popular, called Thunderclap Newman. Now, in 1969, they released a, uh, a song called Something in the Air. And if you listen to the lyrics, I'm going to read a few of them, uh, some of them out to you. You'll notice that they're pretty typical of that generation that was, was really into protests, okay? And revolution, even, for that matter. Here's what the lyrics said. Call out the instigators because there's something in the air. Lock up the streets and houses because there's something in the air. Hand out the arms and ammo. We're going to blast our way through here. We got to get together sooner or later because the revolution's here and you know it's right and you know that it's right. We have to get it together. We have to get, we've got to get it together now. Now, Thunderclap Newman are saying there's something in the air in that generation in the 60s and that, that something was pointing them towards revolution and uprising and upheaval. Now, what was that something in the air? 
Well, if you know your history or if you were alive at the time, then you know what was in the air. There was a mass disaffection. There's a mass lack of, of support for the status quo. The generation that was in their young, in their teens and in their 20s and early 30s at the time felt very much let down by tradition because the world they inherited was the product of their parents and their grandparents. And those generations before them had really gotten into a lot of wars. They had World War I, World War II, Korea. There led to the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of JFK, the, um, the Cuban Revolution, for that matter. There was also the Civil Rights Movement. And there were so many of these things that were um, bubbling in the culture, including the Vietnam War, that made them think, you know, we're not happy with the way things are, and the only way to fix it is to turn it over. And this is why you see so many protest songs coming out of the 60s, songs by people like the Beatles or Bob Dylan. And if that's the case, if there's something in the air that was causing them to seek mass change, radical and sudden change in many cases, then what was in the air of Israel? What were those things that caused Absalom to want to revolt? And not just Absalom, we can't let the rest of the nation off the hook because Israel as a whole follows him. So what was in the air? Well, here's what we know. Absalom, let's look at him first. Absalom was a man who we can't glorify and we can't vilify. He's a man like most. First, we know he loved justice, or at least he seemed to, because when his sister was raped by Amnon, he took matters in his own hand. Yes, in his own timeline, and we can question his motives, but he was the only one who spoke up, and he's the only one who did something about it, and he kills Amnon after two years. He kills his brother, and he does it because he senses that David is not going to do it. His father isn't good. He's, he's abandoned justice. And with this king in place, there will be no justice. And we, although we can call him self-serving, which I think he was, there's also, we have to realize he, he, he was a man who loved his sister. And we know that because we are told in the text that when Absalom had children, he named his daughter Tamar after his sister who was abused, which indicates to us that this is a complicated man. He is not two-dimensional. He feels passionately about justice, but also about himself. But he has a reason to be concerned. There was no justice, he felt. So he wants to bring justice. That's one thing. We also know his life itself gave lots of reason for him to be disaffected. He kills his brother because he's doing justice, he thinks. He doesn't, he doesn't understand. Uh, I don't think he understood that why he should be in exile, because he thought he was doing the right thing that his father should have done. So he then goes when he's being when he finds out he's he's in trouble for having killed his brother, he he seeks exile. He goes into exile in Gesher with his grandfather on his maternal his mother's side, and he spends three years there in exile. After that time, he is then summoned back to Jerusalem, but he comes to Jerusalem and he's not allowed to be free or even enter the king's court. He has to live in house arrest, far away from the court. He can't come into the presence of the king. So he starts to understandably ask questions and say, why did you bring me back? Why not just leave me in exile if you're just going to bring me here and leave me to be to rot? And when he finally, by hook or crook, he receive, he gets an audience with his father. By that point, he'd already been in house arrest for two years. And when he goes, he then has a meeting with his, with his dad that accomplishes nothing. In fact, you can understand he's frustrated. He meets with his father expecting resolution. And the last verse of chapter 14 and the first verse of 15, which we read, are interesting because they give us a hint as to why he may have been frustrated. Here's how that goes. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. Isn't that interesting? He meets with the king expecting resolution, but instead he comes away and the very next thing we read, after at least being kissed by the king, is he immediately begins preparations for the revolution. That's interesting. This is a man who is frustrated. Justice wasn't done. He brought justice and then he is left in exile. And he spends three years in exile, two years in house arrest, and then we're going to find it's four years more before he makes any sort of a formal move for the crown. This is a man who is patient, who is frustrated, and has reason to be concerned. But 
when he goes to Israel and starts looking for, for support, he doesn't find people resisting. Quite the opposite. He finds a very fertile ground for revolution. The Israelites, the elites, and the masses seem to think that this is probably a good idea. Now, why is that? Because it is interesting. We want to think about Absalom being the bad guy and David being the good guy here. And I don't think that's the case at all in the text. I think we're being led to believe they're both wrong, and we'll explain why in it later on. But when Absalom goes to the people, why do the people follow him? Why are they willing to start a revolution and to side against King David, who seemingly was a good king up until relatively recently? Well, here's what we know. First, we know that David, when he wanted to build the temple, was told by God in 1 Chronicles 22 that he wasn't to be the right man, and this is why. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build my house, build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. So David has a reputation with God as being bloody. Now, is that the only that's is is that the only reason? Well, we it's not just God who has this opinion of David. And we know this because you have to dig a little deeper in the history books. There's something in, in Jewish culture called the Midrash. If you don't know what that is, it's a word that refers to commentaries that ancient Jewish rabbis wrote on the books of the Old Testament. So in the years long before Christ, these famous and skilled and gifted rabbis wrote commentaries on all the Old Testament, and it was called the Midrash. Now, those aren't scripture. So when we read them, we have to understand they're not the word inspired word of God, but what they are is a historical time capsule. They help us understand what people of that age thought and how they interpreted scripture thousands of years ago. And when we look at this passage about the revolt of Absalom and we look at the Midrash, what we see is that the rabbis had a very interesting take. And first thing they do is they point to Psalm 3. See, Psalm 3 is written, if you read the heading, it says it's written by David when he was fleeing from Absalom. So it's, it's in the context of exactly what we're talking about today. And then they quote the first two verses and hear what they say. Here's what they say in chapter, in Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Now, what we get from that and from what the Midrash says is this. The psalmist is saying, David is saying in that psalm, the Midrash says, the, the Jews, this is the way they interpreted it. He's saying that there's people that were criticizing him, were criticizing David and saying, how could God save this guy? And the reason they were questioning it was because it was common knowledge in Israel that David had slaughtered all of Saul's family in a purge when he became king. It was common knowledge that he had slept with Bathsheba while she was married to Uriah and that he had subsequently had Uriah murdered. Apparently that was common knowledge in Israel. It was all the scuttlebutt. It was the, the gossip going through town. But it wasn't just that. Israel also seems to have, there was a large group of people in the country who also agreed with God's assessment and thought that David entered into too many wars and he was too liberal in using men and cost too many men in reckless endeavors. So many parents were frustrated and angry that their sons and their husbands were dying because of David's policies. And we not only see this in the Midrash, but in the next chapter of Samuel, while David is fleeing, um, they come to a, to a town and a man comes out to greet David and his, his entourage, but he doesn't come to greet them. Here's what he says, and his name is Shimei. He says, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son, Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. And so, why does Absalom find such a willing population to go along with him? Because David wasn't as popular as sometimes our Sunday schools make us think. David was a man who was a man who was a king who could be ruthless at times, and people didn't approve of his policies. He's a man who had seemingly neglected justice because they saw what he did to Bathsheba and Uriah. He, and then they see a man like, like, like Absalom, who seems to be the opposite. And so, there is a, a, an understanding here that the problems in Israel were real, David wasn't the best king, 
And so there was a real claim, a real beef against David by Absalom and by Israel. So in the context of that, now we know there are real grievances, just like you and I have real grievances with maybe our church, our workplace, our families, our government. We have real beefs. We have real issues, maybe. But what do we do with them next? And here's where we move to the next point. If those were our problems, well, what are the what are the what are the partners? And what do they do with their grievances? You know? And the answer is pretty simple. People who have an axe to grind will always find other people who have the same axe to grind and they beget become friends and they talk a lot. And you know why? Because we are sinful humans and we love to have people around us who affirm what we believe and think. And when I am angry at the government for something they've done, there is nothing that feels better to my sinful heart than gathering with other people who agree with me and just lambasting the government. That's, we're sinners. And so grieving people, or will always, not grieving, people with grievances will always find other people with grievances. And they'll have a party of complaining and conspiring and gossiping and bad-mouthing because it makes them feel better about themselves. And what do they do? They get united with these grievances, right? We all agree on something. Pick a topic. And then you have this group of people who are just as naughty and nasty and, and bitter as you. And then to move from just talking around coffee shops and in blogs into some sort of action, what normally has to happen is a leader has to arise. And Absalom is happy to be the leader of this disaffected group. And how does he seek to lead how does he get people? Well, he does, he's pretty shrewd. He's a smart populist politician. Here's what he does. The first thing is he focuses on his image. He right away gets chariot and 50 men to run before him. Now, Israel, everybody knows, all scholars will agree, Jerusalem was not a big place. It was roughly one square kilometer in David's time, not a big city. A chariot and 50 men running in front of it for a prince would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Jerusalem itself was quite hilly. And some scholars think that this was the first time a chariot ever set wheel within the city. And if that's the case, then what we're seeing, what we're seeing him do, what Absalom is doing, is he is intentionally doing it. It's an image play. He wants everybody to think that he is a prince, that he is a king, he has some glory, he has some power. Because if he's going to lead people, they need to trust that he has the power to do it. So he's putting on an image. But the next thing he does is he starts undermining his own father's regime. He wakes up early, it says, and he goes to uh, to the gate to where justice was to be had, where the judges from the king would come in the morning and they would hear cases and judge them. But he gets there early. Now, does he get there early because he's a hard worker or does he get there before the judges from the king get there so he can get people before they can get to the real judges and he can start undermining and saying things like, you know, if only there was somebody here, but they're not. If only I was judge. He starts to immediately undermine and he says, oh, I would bring justice because you're not getting it now. He's undermining his own king and he does it in such a bold faced way. But he doesn't just undermine, he then deceives. He deceives the people who he's speaking to. And we know this because the text itself says that he steals their hearts. So what it means is he's doing something, he's taking from them a loyalty that isn't his. Their loyalty is to the king that God has put on the throne. And he is stealing it from them. And the way he does it is, again, he's a perfect populist. So what I say, what I mean by that is he is a man who is an elite. But he tries to make everybody think he is just like them. And this is what you see politicians doing regularly. And we've seen it increasingly in the last few years in countries around the world. Where men and women who are wealthy, celebrities, and don't really understand the plight of the blue, blue collar and the downtrodden and the marginalized... They present themselves as being every man, every woman, the commoner. And this is what Absalom is doing. He's deceiving people, just like politicians often, unfortunately, do. He is trying to say, listen, I'm just like you. Although I have a chariot, although I have 50 men, yes, I'm royal blood, but don't worship me. So when they go to pay homage to him, he takes their hand and he kisses it. And because he is trying to convince them that, yes, I'm strong enough. I have the credentials to lead you but I'm also just like you. You see, it's a brilliant political play. He's deceiving them. Then he doesn't just stay, uh, he's not s just satisfied with getting the popular vote. He wants the elites because he knows, like we said at the start, that a revolution needs the elite support. So he does two things. 
First, he invites 200 people with him to go on this sacrificial trip to Hebron. Now, we're told very specifically these 200 people he invited didn't know what he was up to. And we have to believe that's true. But we do know is this. He invited them. He didn't just choose 200 random people. He, with all likelihood, invited key people who maybe weren't his, his supporters yet. And he brought influencers with him. And then, while they're at his party, eating his food, drinking his drink, and he announces, I am now king. Those people are in a very hard place. They almost have to side with him and clap. And not only because there's pressure in being around Absalom, but imagine now going back to Jerusalem and Joab, this brutal warrior that serves David, coming up to you and saying, weren't you at that party with Absalom? What would your defense be? Would you say, I was there, but I'm not a supporter of Saul? Does Joab or David seem like the kind of person who would fall for that? You see, what Absalom has done is he has given himself 200 key influencers and brought them into his camp. And then he has this coordinated system where he sends messengers into all the key cities of the land and he tells them all at this time, blow a trumpet and announce that I am king. So that all across the country at the same time, they are being told that it's a fait accompli, that Absalom is king. It's a brilliant strategy. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes for the really elite. He goes for Ahithophel, who is David's chief advisor. He'd be his speechwriter, his, his, his advisor for everything. And David loves Ahithophel and values his, his, his uh, input, as you're going to see if you read on into the later chapters. But why does he go after Ahithophel? Well, it's because Absalom is not a fool. He knows which elites have an axe to grind, which ones have a problem with David. And we know that in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, we are going to learn that Ahithophel had a son named Eliam. And if you, that name strikes a bell, it should, because back in chapter 11, when we hear about Bathsheba, we're told that Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam, which means Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. Is it possible, not just is it possible, it's, it's certain, that Absalom knows that Ahithophel resents David for what he did to that family and his family. And so it's not a surprise that he is willing to join Absalom. And it's not a surprise in the next chapters when he is, when Absalom asks Ahithophel for advice, his advice is take the wives, the concubines of David and sleep with them on the roof of the palace. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? It's sweet poetic justice for Ahithophel. What he did by taking my daughter-in-law or my daughter, my granddaughter, sorry, from the rooftop when he saw her, I will now do in public. And unintentionally, through the wrath and the bitterness and the frustration of Ahithophel, God's words to David come true, that his wives will be given to his enemy and it'll be done in public. So Absalom has now really engineered a brilliant strategy here. But why do the people follow him? Why do they follow Absalom specifically? Well, the answer is quite simple. When we have grievances, we desperately want them answered. And we'll look for people who we think can help us get those answers. And, and there's always somebody presenting themselves as the answer to our questions and the hope for our needs. Demagogues have done this forever. And Absalom, and you know what, we look for somebody who can help. We're not so interested in, how, in this person's character. We're not looking for a moral exemplar. Usually we align ourselves with people who we think will help us get what we want. And does that sound cynical? Maybe. But I'm not alone in thinking it. In 1984, there was a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. And in it, he makes a shrewd observation. He says this, American businessmen discovered long before the rest of us that the quality and usefulness of their goods are subordinate to the artifice of their display. Even the Japanese, who are said to make better cars than the Americans, know that economics is less a science, more, uh, less a science than a performing art as Toyota's yearly advertising budget confirms. And what Postman is saying is spot on. Economics are not driven by great products primarily, or not, not in, entirely especially, but by marketing. I mean, if you've been around long, and if you know that sometimes the better product loses in the market because marketing is king. If you're a certain vintage, you'll remember VHS and beta. Everybody knew VHS tapes and the system were not as good a quality as beta. But beta die, dies out. How come? Marketing. And when it comes to this, Postman says it's not just about products. 
We have made politics the same way. We are image-driven people. So that ever since the debates of Nixon and JFK in the 60s, when they the first televised debates, an, a public image has become more important than your public policy. That your strategy and your political acumen and your abilities and skills are subordinated to how you appear to be in front of a camera. And so elections are largely won by the better marketers. That's Neil Postman's claim. And if that's true, then look at the people you and I support, not just politicians, but pastors. Who is it that we rally around? Think of the pastor, uh, hopefully it's not me, but think of the pastors that you listen to and, and the theologians you listen to and the Christians you listen to. Why do you listen to them? It's usually because they say something and represent something that you want to be or that they promise to give you answers and feed your own grievances. You have a problem with masks? And government regulations, you're going to love a pastor who calls out the government regularly. You have a problem with heresy, you're going to love that theologian or that pastor who just hammers the health and wealth people. And the reason we do this is not because we're necessarily, well, we're all sinners, but it's not because we're terrible human beings, but it's because we're human. And we will seek partners out for the wrong motives. And this is then turning us to the next spot. So if we have problems and then we partner with the wrong people, well, where do we go from here? Where do we go? And here's the question I came away asking this week, thinking about this story. If the grievances are true, if David was not the best king, if there was real grievances, real reason to want him to be removed from office, then not only why does God not let Absalom win, but why does the writer of Samuel present Absalom as being in the wrong. You see, if he had real grievances, if David did deserve to be ousted, if there were problems, why is Absalom said to be stealing the hearts? Why is it at the end of the passage we just read, we are told by the narrator that the conspiracy grew? Not the revol revolt, not this, this um, liberating force by Absalom. We're told it's a conspiracy, it's treachery. So, why? If there's a legitimate concern, just and think about that for us. If we have legitimate problems with our leaders, our workplaces, our families, our governments, whoever it is that we're having troubles with, if that's the case, why is it that you might be wrong in wanting them to be out of office? Why is it that you might be wrong, maybe not in wanting them out of office, but why might you be wrong in wanting to start undermining them, writing blogs against them, slandering them on social media? The same thing goes with your family, your pastor, your workplace, it doesn't matter. See, it's an interesting paradox. And I think the answer comes to us in the fact that Absalom is deemed to be wrong, not because David is right. You see, just because you are wrong in slandering a crooked politician or a crooked pastor or anything, doesn't mean that that makes the other person right. And that is a problem we have. We don't like to, we, we can't reconcile that. We think it's either or. What scripture seems to be saying, what this story is saying is this. The reason that Absalom fails is not because it's right or wrong, but it's because Absalom simply doesn't think about God at all. You see, his issues are real. David isn't going to change. At least he thinks um, he has the power. You know, this is the way he thinks. There's an issue. It's a real issue. Nothing's going to change under this regime. And I have the ability and the power and the support to oust him and to let, take the throne for myself. That makes perfect secular sense, but zero theological sense. Because this is the, what we do understand, that David, when he was being, when he had a chance to kill Saul and take the throne, David continually said, I will not take the throne. If God wants it, to give it to me. He will give it to me, but I won't take it. Now, David, call him what we will, and we have been lambasting him this whole series. But he understood that the priority is what God says, and that God is sovereign. Not your grievance, not the injustice done to you. Nothing takes priority over God's sovereignty and his word. Absalom fails to take his grievances and say, God, what do I do with them? I want to revolt. I should. I would. I, I can revolt. What should I do? What is scriptural? What do? What is your will, Father? He doesn't do that. In the same way, you and I, when we have grievances, we often think 
intellectually, we think pragmatically about what's the best move, but very rarely do we first say, this is what I'm feeling. Lord, tell me if this is a legitimate feeling. Tell me if what I'm proposing to do is legitimate. We don't subordinate our thoughts and our emotions and our actions to the scripture. We instead first think, act, and express our emotions, and then try to justify that with scripture. And listen, I do it all the time. People come to me all the time with these sorts of things. I, uh, the reason I think I'm sensitive to it is because I have the disease. I'm no better than anybody else watching. Um, now, David had the same situation, but his theology didn't stay theoretical. It was practical. David was really good, even though he's failing all the time. He was pretty, really good, pretty good at least, at filtering actions through Scripture. Christ, of course, is the master of it. That when Jesus died, see, when Jesus looked around the world and he saw injustice being done, he could have revolted. He was the king. He could have smashed it to bits. But he chose to die instead of revolt. When, he, when he's being tempted in the desert and when he's on the cross, he endures it and overcomes it by obedience to God. Because he realizes that obedience is more important than his self-interest. So he doesn't say, Lord, I'm, in, I'm struggling and I don't want to suffer. He says, yes, I don't want to suffer, but your will be done. You and I often don't get that far. We only say we don't want to suffer. We don't need to suffer, so we will not suffer. I don't have to put up with this prime minister, so I won't. Or whatever that situation is. We don't subordinate every thought to Christ. We don't take captive every thought to Christ, as Paul tells us, which we really should. What we ought to be doing is taking every grievance and laying it at the cross and asking for God for his opinion. We don't partner with other grumblers who make us grumble more. The first thing we should do when we're grumbling is realize a dangerous situation we're in and take it to Christ and say, I don't want to be a grumbler because it dishonors you. And what we do is we starve bitterness. Every time we do that, when we resist the urge to partner with other grumblers and undermine our leaders and our friends and our family, what we're doing, every time we resist that, we're starving pride just a little. We're starving we're our, our bitterness just a little, but we're feeding our humility by subordinating even our own feelings, which this culture is saying are, are, are paramount. We subordinate it to the cross. If we spend more time in the Bible then we'd spend feeding our anger by, anger by getting worked up by YouTube videos and by blogs and by uh, different media outlets that we follow. We would be far better at obeying God than we are at times. See, because the gospel says, I don't need to judge the injustice in the world. My role in the world is to be just. And there are times when we will have to stand up. We will have to be bold. We may have to push back, but not nearly as many times as we do it. And certainly, often, very often, not the way we do it as well. We are not to be known as a combative people, but a merciful people. And that is difficult for us because we're feeling pressure. And when that happens, you want to fight. So if we, the only way, see, how, is it, how do we do that? How do we put our emotions aside and start to be a people that love and lay down our glory for the sake of others when we want to pick up the, the sword? How do we do that? Well, the answer is, of course, when you experience justice, the justice of God, which is the fact that he had mercy on you when you didn't deserve it. When you actually experience that, you're going to then trust him to judge the world. You're going to say, I am being treated unjustly. This government is unjust. This church is unjust. These people are unjust. This banking system, economic system, this housing market is unjust. But Lord, you are just. And I know it because I've tasted it. And because I know you to be just... I will live a certain way in this world. I won't let my anger get the better of me, not because I am better, but because I know one who is better. And you see, the only way to change is to experience grace. If you don't experience grace, you'll never show grace. And that's why continually, I tell you every week, stare at the gospel. Read it to yourself again and again. Apply it into your life. Massage it into your life in different ways. Ask, what is the gospel saying to me when I'm angry about a mask mandate? or another lockdown. What is the gospel saying? Don't go grumbling right away. That's tempting. I, I, I know that. Let's seek it. Let's submit everything to Christ. Everything. Let us be a church that's known for being radically submissive in this way, that we submit all thoughts, all emotions, every idea and action to the cross and to the gospel and to his word. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for your word. Lord, this is a, it's a tough passage. It's one we read so often and we just think it's about a revolution <laughs> and Absalom not being nice and David being good. And it's not, Lord. It, it, you, you once again diagnose our hearts. You show us why we, um, why we are so easy, easily drawn into rebellion against you by slandering people. Um, Lord, we are wicked, but you are gracious. Gracious. God, thank you that you forgive our sins in your son. Thank you that your son died for us. Help us to, to be more like him, Lord, that we would lay aside our glory for the sake of becoming servants for those who need to be served. God, we love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew, with that, let me read a benediction over you. And then with that, we'll bring to the end the formal part of the service. But then we're going to go to Pastor Paul, who's going to share some announcements with us. But let me read this benediction over you. So you don't need to close your eyes. I'm simply saying this is me saying to you a, a good word, the benediction, the good word from God. Let's do that. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now with that, take it away, Pastor Paul. Hey everyone, Pastor Paul here. Just wanted to take a few moments and share with you some announcements about what's going on at Redeemer over the coming weeks. Uh, next Sunday, we are intending to be back in person. We will be having one service at 11 a.m. Make sure to register for that this coming week. Uh, children's ministry will also be available at that 11 a.m. service. If we're finding that uh, we're filling up, we want to make sure that there's enough space for everybody. It's not too crowded. So if we do find it's filling up, we may open up a 930 service as well. But for now, just an 11 o'clock this coming Sunday, January 23rd. Kids nights are also going to be kicking off on Wednesday, January 19th. So if you have children uh, and are in that age category to send them there, January 19th, 6.30 p.m. Youth from grades 5 to 12. We are meeting again in person. We are meeting on Fridays, but we're meeting both groups together from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, just to make sure there's a little more uh, safety protocols in place. Uh, so make sure that's going to be in place for the next few weeks until further notice. Community groups are also kind of paused right now. We want to encourage you, uh, if you're able to meet online through Zoom, just to connect and pray together. And if you can find ways to connect as a group, we really want to encourage that. But until the capacity limits for indoors are lifted, we're kind of stuck with what we're doing right now. Uh, and also, uh, lastly, there is a newcomers class coming up February 13th at 1 p.m. If you're newer to re the Redeemer community in the last couple of years throughout COVID, whether it's been in person or maybe even just online, and you want to learn more about Redeemer and what makes us tick and how we operate, uh, make sure to connect with the office and sign up to do that. That's all for now. God bless. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you to the worship team. Thank you to everyone who's been involved. Thank you for joining us today. It has been my pleasure to lead us in worship today. I pray you've been uplifted and encouraged. Go now in the grace and peace of Christ, and we'll see you next week.